Awake, awake. It's interesting here that the prophet Isaiah is telling God to wake up. Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. The arm of the Lord is a symbolic term um, speaking about a couple of things, really. First of all, the covenant. The arm and the hand were covenant. Uh, you, you made covenant with the hand and with the arm, but also speaking of his power. And Isaiah, in his desperation and intercessory prayer, is trying to activate God's power because he sees a great need. And we are in a situation today, I'm sure that if, you're, if you have a heart for the things of God and a heart to see God move and a heart that mourns and laments the state of the nation and also the state of the church, in some cases the apostasy of the church. If you have that heart, you want God's hand activated, you want God's arm activated, you want God to move as he did in days of old. And there's that tendency almost when you get that desperate to shout, Lord, wake up! Don't you see what's going on? But the thing about it is, is he, ha- he does see what's going on and he, through his servants over the years, has proclaimed uh, repent- or the need for repentance, should I say, to people. And we're in the state we're in today in Britain as a, as a nation, as a country, and also, sadly, in the church, because we did not heed those warnings. We didn't listen to the prophetic voice of preachers who proclaimed things uh, that would happen if we did not get our act together. And now we're at a stage where if we don't get our act together very quickly, we're going to see the demise of much of what many of us grew up with, which was some semblance of, of Britain being a Christian nation. If you're younger, you probably don't remember stuff like that. But if you're older, you certainly do. And we maybe just saw the outward effects, churches closed, less people in church. We noticed it incrementally, but we did not heed the voice. Of those who said, keep going down this trajectory, keep going down this path, and you're going to see real trouble for the church and for the nation. And we've seen in the last few decades the the almost the, 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 the turnaround from being a, a nation whose laws were founded mostly upon scripture to now having laws that are an abomination to scripture unto God. The prophet Isaiah saw in his time the apostasy, uh, the falling away, and he says here, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord, awake as in the ancient days. You see, Isaiah understood from history, from biblical history, you could say, that there were ancient days when God moved mightily and God delivered his people. And he refers here to the deliverance out of Egypt when he says, in the generations of old. We've, I've spent a lot of time recently considering the generations of old. been reading that book again that I read many years ago, Reese Howell's intercessor, that man who founded the Bible College of Wales, but with a small band of faithful prayer warriors, prayed deep intercessory prayers during the war for the deliverance of the Allied nations, Britain in particular, and many, many people said that thanks to the prayers of these hills, Britain eventually won the war. And really the natural was, it was never going to happen. It took the supernatural, you could say, it took intercession, it took the prayers of God's people. I'm not saying Reese Hills was the only one praying, but he was certainly instrumental. 
And we need such intercessory prayer today, and we need intercessors today. We need people whose hearts are cut to the, to the very root by what's going on around about us. We don't need commentary. The days of commentary, oh, isn't, aren't things getting really bad? Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, they are. Well, we can see that. We don't need people with that, uh, you know, disinterested punditry about it. We need people who say, I'm going to only go to my knees before God. So we, we've been considering up, up, up in Scotland, we, we started a, a meeting on Friday there uh, for people who, who were serious minded about engaging with God for a change, not just a change, but for, for transformation. To go back to the generations of old, in a sense, to go back to the old paths. Now, we're not going to have 1930s or 1940s or 1950s church. We're not all going to uh, roll up here in their, you know, old cars and stuff. We're not talking about going backwards and being an old-fashioned people, but we're talking about going back to the ancient faith, the ancient ways, the ancient paths. To the generations of old. When, when people understood these things, the need for prayer for the nation, the need for uh, tarrying and waiting on God, the need for being serious minded about things and not being taken away by the, the pull of the world and all its glittering attractions. They don't seem so attractive and they're not that glittering in the last few months. The world doesn't have the pool it once had because, quite frankly, you can't get out of one of these anyway. And, you know, for a long time, you can't get out at all. So the attractions of the world are, are no longer really there. But we're not yet in a place, brothers and sisters, where the people are crying out to the Lord. Because the fear of God is not in them, it says in Scripture. They fear the virus. They fear losing their jobs. They fear the economic instability and uncertainty. They, they fear the ramifications of virus, this virus and other viruses. They fear a lot of what they see. They, they fear riots in the streets. They have a lot of fear going on, but they don't fear the one they must fear and should fear, and that's the Lord. He says, Art thou not it that hath cut Rahab and wounded the dragon? Prophetic symbolism, what does Rahab mean? It means, it means the great harlot. It means, it's speaking about Egypt. It's speaking about powers, worldly powers, governments, kingdoms, that are in opposition to God. We, we saw in Egypt, Babylon, Rome, ancient Kingdoms or, or empires that were hostile to God, but hostile to his people Israel. The Babylonians, the Assyrians, Rahab, of course, this is referring to Egypt. But also, not only speaking about a historical deliverance by God, bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt through uh, the Red Sea, but also speaking prophetically, really, uh, and to our day, I believe, because Isaiah prophesied to this generation, speaking prophetically of any world system that arises from the sea of humanity. That's why he speaks about the dragon or the sea serpent, the, 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 the tani. And we, we see it in our day, we see it in institutions like the EU, and other uh, organizations or groupings of nations, empires. And, and interestingly, I think I shared this last week, uh, I heard a lady speaking, and I'd never thought about this like this, but she said that you, you think of the masses of people that are on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, these things, they are actual nations in a sense. They're groupings of people. Uh, virtual nations, we would call them. But it's interesting when you see these things rising out of the earth, they're always hostile to God and his kingdom. Always. 
That's what the Bible calls it, Mystery Babylon, Leviathan, there's many names for it. But ultimately what it boils down to is that when a grouping of people, a nation, is not a Christian nation, is not a set apart holy nation, then that nation will drift off into idolatry and darkness and be part of what the Bible calls Babylon. And so he's saying there, you've already dealt with this problem, bringing your people out of the, the dragon system, Rehab Babylon, you've already done this, Lord. We remember your works of old. We remember the people that you pulled out of Egypt and set apart for your purpose and brought them through the wilderness into the promised land. We can say tonight, we remember the great works of God of old, the Reformation. You know, I, I, I can't mention the Reformation, but as a Scot, we're talking about John Knox. I know you had your uh, Reformation uh, heroes, if you like. But the Reformation that took place, yes, there were, if arguably, secular aspects to it, but it was a deliverance from popery, superstition, priestcraft, and idolatry that took place here in England, that took place in Scotland, and across the British Isles. Then we see God's mighty servants, men like Whitfield, who, and, and Wesley, who preached across Britain and saved Britain from a fate that we could have faced very, 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 very possibly, like the French did with the French Revolution. Britain was headed for that too, a, dep a depraved, debauched nation, headed for the hell that the, those in France experienced, and Christians persecuted. God delivered us from that because he sent his servants, and the gospel was preached, and churches were planted, and, and the nation was turned around. And at other times, we give them all the days of old, the generations of old, the ancient times. Many, many times the hand of God, we spoke about the Second World War, First World War II, many wars where God's hand was seen, delivering us from a very real threat of being destroyed as a nation. So the prophet Isaiah here is not just speaking to his generation, he's speaking to ours. And we're saying, Lord, how can we activate your power that once more we can see our churches fill, we can see fire coming from the pulpit? No longer just mush and slush. How can we see your mighty hand move again? O oh, arm of the Lord, awake, awake, a desperate plea. Some would say almost a rude plea or a rude statement telling God to wake up. As we'll see, we might not have time tonight because we need to draw this to a close fairly soon, but uh, I'll be back next week uh, and we will continue looking at some of this. But it's not God that has to awaken friends, it's you and I. God's always been ready to move mightily. It's us that's departed from Him. Not heaven that's, that's going on holiday. Or as many, and, and sadly some Christians think that, that, that God is in this uh, place where he's decided that he, he's, he's going to be distant and aloof. And, and you know, uh, no longer compassionate. No, we're the ones that have drifted away. Anyway, he says here, Art thou not it which hath dried the sea? That's talking about the, the Egypt deliverance. The waters of the great deep that hath made the depths of the sea a way for the ransom to pass over. There's a prophetic message here because the sea, the many waters, is, is the world system and the peoples of the world. And, and we need a way out of being stuck in Babylon. The many waters of Babylon. We need to walk over and dry land. 
in a prophetic, symbolic way, if you understand, a metaphor. To escape Babylon and be what we're purposed and destined by God to be in Britain, which is a holy nation. That ancient name for the British Isles, Albion, meaning the Holy Isle, the White Island. White signifying holiness and holiness being set apart and set unto God in his purpose. You might say, well, we've heard this before. We hear it all the time. Yes, but we need to hear it until we get it. I don't want to live in a Britain that we're living today. And I, I, let me just say this. I live in probably the most oppressed part of it now. Or oppressive part. Of it. Try living under Nicholas Sturgeon for five minutes and tell me you've got a heart here. Therefore the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion. Isn't that good news? We're coming back singing. We can take the mask off. I know some of you already have and you're, you're singing and some are just humming and some are going, oh, what, what are they doing? But the redeemed of the Lord shall return with singing. To Zion. I keep saying this. Uh, Zion was the fortress city. Uh, in Jerusalem, it was, a, it was a fortress city. And the word Kalil means fortress city. So you're the Zion of the north here. Everlasting joy shall be upon their head. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. I, even I, the Lord says, am he that comforteth you. Who art thou that shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die and of the son of man which shall be made as grass? We are living in an age where the fear of man brings a snare. It's the fear of man that dominates in Britain today. That's why we're wearing these masks. Now I'm not saying we should all get rebellious and start having police officers and get handcuffs on and stuff. I've said before, I'll say it again, we're not going to start a, a war over face masks. But let me ask you this, when they say to you, if they say to you, not only are you not going to sing in church, you're not we're going to close churches forever. Don't tell me that that is not in their heart to do. And don't tell me that they wouldn't do that if they could. Then will you say, well, well we don't care. We're going to be in. You see, up in Scotland, we had the Covenanters. And the Covenanters were forbidden from assembling. And so but they decided, well, we're going to assemble anyway, but we'll assemble in secret. So they met out in the moors, caves, wherever they could do so in secret. But they knew that if they were caught assembling, they could lose their liberty, they could lose their livelihood, and they did lose their lives. And were shocked just for having church. All oh, those days could never come back. Really? Really? If you believe that, I've got a bridge to sell you. So, but the fear of man. The fear of man brings a snare. Do we, what did, what did Peter say? We choose to obey God rather than men. You need to purpose in your heart right now that if it comes to it, that will be your response. Right now, but also it ought to be your automatic response from the day you were regenerated and became a Christian. I'm running out of time, folks, so I might need to take this up next week. But it says, And forgettest the Lord thy maker that has stretched forth the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth and has feared continually every day because of the fury of the oppressor as if he were ready to destroy and where is the fury of the oppressor? It will never be my intention to speak from any pulpit to say to you that we need to be a rebellious people. But we live in that paradox, and I'll close with this, we live in that paradox in the tension of your life. Be that because we're God's people, because uh, we have the Spirit of God within us, because we're Christian, we're disposed to be law abiding people, aren't we? We're disposed to be those who would support law and order, support the government, support good government. We're, 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 a, we're a, an obedient people because that, that's who we are. That's our, our DNA as Christians. 
And so we would always support government, law and order, particularly good government, sensible government. But if you are a Christian, you will, I'm sure, agree with this, that the minute you detect tyranny or injustice or corruption in those who rule over us, everything in you rises up to resist that. Resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. Many have been famed, eh, claimed to have said, like Tyndall, John Knox, it goes to do for me. Resistance to tyranny is obedience to God. So when we see antichrist governments arise in the earth, when we see laws that are against God's word being passed in the earth, when we see that you can go to bingo, snooker, pubs, you name it, and you don't need all this stuff on, and you can mingle like you like, but you have to come to church and sit there with that, with a mask on, something is going on. And it's time we stop pretending that it wasn't. And you can be an obedient citizen, you can be a good citizen, all of that. But let me just say this to you. There may come a time where, and I believe that they're, they're very close to that if they're not already there, they'll cross the line. So we need to be people who are, and, and what do we do? What's our response very, very quickly before we turn to the Lord's table? The most immediate thing we do is pray. I say that every time, don't I? Pray. Fervently. The effective the effectual prayer of a righteous man will be So let's read up our efforts. Amen. Prayer. Let's commit to meeting as, as, as long as we're able to, to be the people of God. Because let me just say this to you. Every time you walk through that door, downstairs, you're a witness to the streets around you. That God has a people and a remnant in the earth who put meeting and assemble together. As it should be a rightful priority. And let's hope it encourages those of them out there who, who may be thinking, what is our response? We're ready with the answer, aren't we? The Lord bless you, folks. Let's turn to the table of the Lord as we, we um, now come to take communion together. We have these wee... Uh,